I guess most of you have heard of the Libyan revolution um, that happened in 2011. During the revolution, I was studying at the medicine school, and then it was, it was, I was basically just a, a medicine student. I was watching, honestly speaking, I watched a lot of Grey's Anatomy, um, for the ones who knows it, and I thought that it's, it's just cool to be a doctor and be a surgeon. That's why I went to medicine school. And then when the revolution happened, it started first as protests, and then very peaceful protests. It didn't take a long time to just turn to a bloody war. I was home for almost six months because my school was closed due to the war that was going, taking place in Tripoli. And then in August 2011, I volunteered to work at Tripoli Central Hospital, where I just realized that we've been through war. Um, during the last six months, I would just, at that time, I was just thinking that, well, this is a revolution and, and people are really seeking democracy, freedom of speech, etc. And then until I got into a room where I found two patients, um, two young men, one from the Gaddafi side and who was anti-revolution and the other one who was pro-revolution, being in this, ended up in the same room, I just realized that, well, um, our work towards democracy and freedom of speech and, and human rights, etc., has just started now. That was the time where I co-founded the Together We Build It organization and primarily our focus was to support the political participation of women and youth. However, after my university reopened again, um, in the first day when I went there, I was waiting for colleagues of mine and then there was this man, very randomly, who came to me and handed me a piece of paper, something, something like maybe this size. And then he just handed it to me and he didn't tell me anything and he went away. And then when I opened it, it just said, this will sound so silly, please don't wear any pants anymore. And I was like, what, what, what is this? Seriously, what is this? So I took the paper with me and then when I met my colleagues, some of them were male colleagues and I showed it to them and I was like, what, what is this? And then they were like, oh, that's, we, we don't know. We don't know what is this. That was in 2011. At that time, I just realized that, well, my, my male colleagues didn't really take it personal, but, but for me, as a woman, because he was only handing it to women, I took it very personal. And then, that was in 2011. In 2012, I was attending a meeting in the east of Libya and Benghazi, so I'm, I'm from Tripoli, the west. And the meeting was about advocating for women's rights um, in, in a political campaign. And then when we were in the meeting, suddenly an armed group just crashed the meeting. And at some point, again, I didn't really know what's happening. We were in a building where there was lots of press conferences happening, etc. So I thought maybe they just wanted to evacuate the room. Someone important is coming and who, who might hold a press conference or something. And then suddenly they started talking about, well, um, you're working on women's rights. This is a Western ideology. Um, um, the Muslim community is not like this. Um, and that was the first time where I felt that, hold on a second, there is something changing in the society because we've, I, I grew up in Libya where I know everyone is Muslim. I lived in a Muslim community and, and basically no one ever said that before. However, after this incident, we had a meeting with the international community to Libya, basically embassies and international organizations. And because when it happened, it was like a huge incident where everyone was talking about how come an armed group will just crash into a meeting. And in particular, it's a meeting about women's rights. And then when I started talking, I said, well, they are an extremist group. And the response was, hold on. You can't name that an extremist group. They're just an extremist against women's rights. And I just found that so fascinating. The most ironic thing about this, so this happened in 2012. In 2014, the same group was identified by the Security Council of the United Nations as a terrorist group. So it just, I, I was just thinking for those two days, if people really listen to women insights, maybe, maybe, maybe things have, have been better. 
And, and in particular, I'm saying women. I'm not just saying that women are smarter than men. But, but I'm just saying that when things started, start to get extreme, when things started, starts, when the society starts to change, women are the first one who sense that for very simple practical reasons because, because when a society becomes extreme towards any, anything, usually it affects the most marginalized groups in the community. In the case of Libya, that, that was women. And I mean, I, I would say in the case of Libya, um, listening to, um, to the parliamentarian debate in the EU parliament, I think just two days ago, where someone was saying, uh, women are smaller, women are weaker, etc. I just realized that the problem of gender inequality is actually universal. Um, it's not only in Libya, it's not only in Muslim communities or whatsoever, it's, it's a mindset. Anyways, then in 2015, one day in the morning, in the first day of the academic year, I was driving my sister to her school. And in my neighborhood, I just saw people that, again, I, I didn't, I've never seen them before. They were wearing clothes that are not Libyan traditional clothes. Um, women were wearing niqab, burqa, just in front of our house. And then when my sister came back from school, she was only 13 at that time, she was like, you know, Hajar, at school, my classmates were talking and saying, everyone was commenting about that. And it was so interesting that 13 years old girls were, were calling that school, it's a Daesh school, it's an ISIS school. And the only reason they called that, because they just saw that it's something very extreme. It's something very extreme that came to the society. It just looks the same as what they see on the TV that's called ISIS and Daesh. The moral of what I'm sharing right now, again, is that as long as we will miss women's insights in terms on topics related to security, peace building, de-radicalization, countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism, we will keep missing on an opportunity for a less military response to the violence that grows in societies. Working in the field of peace building for almost six years now, and, and especially now with the rise of the global interest in extremism, de-radicalization, again, countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism, all of these intellectual terminologies that, that really people in societies don't understand. I just realized that I don't think there is a global understanding on what is extremism, what is terrorism, Everyone is identifying that from a different perspective because if I will be frank and honest with you, globally in the media, extremism and terrorism, it sounds like a certain group of people at, at this time, in particular Muslims, who are being violent. Maybe they are violent in nature. That's how, when we say the other side of the Mediterranean see us. And then our side of the Mediterranean see that extremism and terrorism is having countries selling weapons to armed groups in our countries. And more or less, we all get, we all want the same thing. All societies just want to live in peace, I guess. But then why is it so difficult just to have a one understanding on what is extremism and what is terrorism? The way people view extremism and terrorism and, and the policies of the global communities, especially directed towards the Middle East or North Africa, it's either in two ways. Either it's an attempt from the international community to interfere in terms of prevention, because you know, we, we are a Muslim community and, and radicalization is in our blood, so, so we do need prevention. Or they will interfere to counter the violent extremism and the radicalization that already exists. However, in both cases, it, it just didn't work. And here, I, I always remember a, a quote, I heard it from the, um, a Swedish uh, parliamentarian, he said, the ones who knows the problem are not necessarily the ones who knows the solution. And that's what's happening for years and years and years now. Because in 2012, as Libyan women, we told the international community that, well, 
we see something going wrong, something is happening, there is a rise of radicalization in the society. And at that time, because it didn't hit the international community yet, it wasn't viewed as extremism, it wasn't viewed as terrorism, it was just viewed as a group against women's rights. I will share with you an incident that just happened to me January 2017. Um, I, there's no need to mention the country, but I was sitting in a, Euro, a European country um, and I was in a coffee shop reading a book written in Arabic. And I was in the coffee shop for two hours almost. My sister and my mom was doing shopping and I was just waiting for them. And then after some time I wanted to go out for a bit and just get some fresh air. And I left my books on the table and when I went out, literally, in, in less than two minutes, I had a man, he, he's probably in his mid-50s, who came to me and he said, oh, well, miss, you forgot your books on the table. And my immediate honest response was that, I was like, oh, thank you, but I'm, I'm going back to the books. And then he said, yes, but your books are written in Arabic. And to be honest, I just didn't know what to reply to him. And then I said, so wh what's the problem? And then he said, you know what that means. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And he was like, well, books written in Arabic, left on the table, and you left, it will make people feel concerned. And then he just went. Apart from the incident in itself, I found the discussion that followed up that was, was very interesting. From friends, family, um, mainly who are not Libyans, mainly who are not Muslims, who, who are really good activists. Um, I wrote about it a piece in the Huffington Post and then people started to tell me, but you, you can't really say that man is, is a potential extremist, that man is an ignorant. I, I don't know. However, I would want to ask a very, I, I know, a very uncomfortable question. How many of you in this room thinks that this man is an ignorant? Raise your hand. And how many in you in this room thinks that this man is a potential extremist. You see, the, the, question, the question doesn't make sense, right? But it's the same question that's being asked to us when they would tell us, well, as, as a Muslim, um, what's the percentage, the possibility of you to become an extremist or a potential uh, terrorist? It's the same question that is being asked to people back home where they are, they, again, as we were saying earlier, putting people into these boxes, making people that they need to choose. Either they are with this side or they are with this side. And, and guess what? For, for locals, we view both sides wrong. Because if we are talking about extremism and terrorism, as the use of violence, then whether it was committed by a group that says they are Muslims or committed by a group that says whoever they are, it's, it's still, unfortunately, um, the majority of people are being put in this paradoxical where they really need to belong to something. And ending up, if, if people are being asked about their identities, even if there is this minority group of people who are using their identity in the wrong way, people are, people are always proud of their identity and they will always say that they belong to this identity. The bottom line of what I want to say here is that the same, if, if we allow such a discussion to happen in one region, then it should happen in all regions, the same way that we discuss it either in Libya and the Middle East and North Africa with Muslims, with, with far-right extremists. And if we want to allow, so if, if you felt that it was very uncomfortable and very weird question for me to, to tell you, please tell me, this European man, is he an ignorant, is he a racist, or is he an extremist? 
just me putting you all Europeans in the same category as him, then it's the same thing that's happening in, in the fight or what's called the fight against extremism, the fight against terrorism. And I guess at the end, it's, it's just unfair for us and, and for everyone um, who, who really at the end just wants to live there, go back to their peaceful lives. Um, and I think at, at this point, um, it, it was just a couple of months ago, uh, 2000, 2016, October, um, I was speaking in a conference about countering violent extremism and then I said, just because of my Libyan passport, I'm being identified as a potential extremist and as a potential terrorist. And then a journalist said, yeah, but there, there, there isn't any policies that say such a thing until Donald Trump proved him wrong first week in January, um, where he actually, where, where we all heard of the Muslim ban, where basically I'm being identified as a potential extremist, as a potential terrorist, as a potential threat, um, just because of my Libyan passport. I'll leave it just there. Thank you. <laughs>